How about now? All right, History Buff Season 2. Welcome back, everyone. I guess we're live because RA hit the wrong link, so we're doing a happy hour, a Thursday happy hour edition of Oh, we should have done that. Oh. Of the History Buffs, yeah. <laughs> happy hour with the History Buffs. I like that, actually. Yeah, that actually works. So, so you're already following the stuff. When, you, when you're as creative as you are, you just fall your way into things, and I like that. As always, the aforementioned RA Minahan, what? Ned Snark, and Twitterless Austin, who I think is back on Twitter now. Yeah, I'm back on Twitter. I should yeah. change that at some point. You just can't quit it, huh? No. You can't quit it. And the heart of shades are, are new, too. It's bright. The sun's right in my face. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. Turn the other way. When you're on your deck overlooking the water, it's tough. You know, you know it is. We, we get our sympathy. Yeah. yeah. It's a tough yeah, life. We feel bad for you. It's a really tough life that I live. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are, after much debate, Ari really want to do uh, a Juneteenth discussion. Um, but Ned actually won out and decided to go with <laughs> decided to go with uh, Napoleon instead. This is something we've been trying to do for a while. It's just scheduling stuff has been a big issue. It's mostly been Ari's fault, actually, but I guess I'll take a little bit of blame also. Um, you want to show the basement off real quick, Ari? Right. No. Yeah. You no. don't want to show? Oh. Not Pre show, really. Ken, the basement is finished. Basement's done. Basement's done. Looking real um, good. It looks finished. great. Really shows Solid. how long the. The YouTube's been down. Is this the first live show actually since the? the no, they had the minute the ninety day show last night. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that'd be that'd be a tough way to, to open. The, we'd be a tough op uh, opener back. I know. <laughs> that would be that would be hard. <laughs> Not when do you, uh, by the way, Ari? When does uh, the OG show come back? You got to do that now that the, you have to ask Steve from Providence. You, you guys can go live, and you got a new basement. You're gonna have to ask Steve from Providence. Still bad blood there. That's no, no? all I'll say. There's a lot of bad blood there. A lot of bad I'll just blood. say it. it's like it's like the Beatles, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which one are you though? We, we're, we're the only the next time we're gonna all be in the same room is gonna be at Steve from Providence's funeral. It's all set. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the the next and the last time we're all in the same room. That's all. Yeah. Yep. So, Will it be a Napoleonic type funeral? Those question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, sure. So. <laughs> Nap nice. We look at Napoleon as a what a a short guy with a with a bad temper. Basically, that's that's how a lot. Yeah, of you kind of think of like like Napoleon syndrome, you know. Yeah, he was average that's size was for his age, just like Correct. I am. Yep. Yes, he was actually five eight, I think. Yeah, at the time of his he death, five, he was five eight. Two. No, five eight. Oh, eh. exactly. Yeah. See? average size. That's all. The Stalin. Stalin was five five. Yeah, Stalin was a short one too. Was he really? Churchill, yeah. I think, was five five ish. Yeah. Oh yeah, Hitler was like five six. We're already off topic. Well, I, 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 I basically that. led by people either in a wheelchair or people under like five, six. Yeah. Right. In the English, in the English speaking world, Napoleon has the reputation of being, you know, short and and having temper tantrums, but it was all, you know, propaganda. Propaganda against him. Yeah. By the English, every other English, country in Europe. No, no, the English newspapers, really. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I will say it is impressive. And we'll get into more of the, the details in a minute, but just the sheer fact that so many people despised him. Yeah. In oh, around yeah. Europe is yeah. like, I mean, I, I'm I'm fascinated by just that because he, you know, he, he was able to, you know, basically do whatever he wanted for essentially a decade and twenty years. The people in power yeah. hated him for it, but they're like, well, I don't know, we can't do anything about it. I don't know what to do. We'll I try mean, this. We'll try that. It won't work. And, I mean, he was surrounded on all sides by enemies and somehow stayed in power and thrived for twenty years. Like how, like. We talked about World War II earlier, and the big reason why Germany lost both world wars it was because they're surrounded on all sides, and they ended up getting just demolished. I mean, it's it's impressive that Napoleon lasted as long as he did, being surrounded by enemies. Right. Um, so we'll get we'll get to that, but Napoleon will come into power at the I don't know if you can call it the tail end, but I guess call it the result of what was the French Revolution. Yeah, Talk that really it. worked out well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That um, worked out real well for them. Take, take notes. All that bloodshed for fucking nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't want to go too much into the actual French Revolution itself, but we'll start with a... We already did that. Yeah, we did do that. We the did. moderate phase. Um, go back and watch season one. I'm, I'm sure you all will. Exactly. Um, moderate phase where, you know, some change. We want a constitutional monarchy. And, you know, we're not asking for a lot. We just don't want these high bread prices and all that. Uh, and then the radicals will take over. And then all of a sudden you can't be pro-revolution enough uh you can't if you are 
if you are not pro revolution, you are anti revolution. You'll get your head chopped off for it. Um, well, that sounds familiar. Do you, you think of any parallels? Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. just a few. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, but eventually, it goes on for years, and that'll lead eventually to Napoleon basically seizing power. And and it started by them. The by them, I mean the the government at the time trying to use Napoleon as a kind of a basically French propaganda, trying to prop him up and almost have Napoleon become like the puppet face of the French government or the French leadership. He was a successful military man. I want to say, correct me if I'm wrong now, but I think the Middle East, right? He's yeah. now in the Middle East. Well, he was in and and the French Revolution yeah. was, a, was, a, was a huge threat to the, all the crowned heads in Europe. Right. So it was kind of doomed from the start because you had a lot of external players trying to undermine it, right? Um, but then what they didn't, and, and by the way, they almost did it themselves, right? As you pointed out, it's they they just kept you know going from bad to worse bad to worse what they didn't count on though was this disorganization in paris actually did pretty well militarily because when the european forces started throwing armies at this this french at the directory or whatever whatever it was called i don't even you know what france yeah yeah you know the even before even like a year before napoleon they won they beat they won a, they won big battles in like the lowlands and the netherlands and that area and Napoleon came to fame and ro rose up quickly through the ranks through Italy, through southern France and Italy, where this, you know, he quickly became a general at 26, maybe even younger. I'm not I sure about younger, that. He was yeah, younger. I think it was like 26 or 27. And, and he just beat the shit out of the Austrian Italians all the way across northern Italy. Into yeah, because he, was, he wasn't the main, like, uh, he wasn't the main attack force. No, he, he wasn't. Was no. Decoy, and no. He just ended up just tearing through southern France and Italy. Correct. And, and then liberating them, by the way. And setting them up yeah, as and he as also he also was a he also spread the yeah he spread the ideas of the French Revolution mm -hmm. correct well the that beautiful was, that was like part his... of so I was the the beautiful part of being a leading a revolutionary army is everywhere you go you're liberating places yep doesn't matter what yeah. you do yep you know look and, at the look at the the Viet Cong and the Vietnam War they were liberating everyone but he's he's the Red he, Army liberated yeah. liberated so many people from the Nazis so many people were liberated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. certainly liberated them. So, I feel so bad there was for, I've, uh, just side sidebar. I feel bad for people like the Ukraine in World War II who are like, okay, we're under Soviet rule. This sucks. And then the Nazis came in. They're like, holy shit, this sucks. And then the Soviets right. came right back. They're like, god <laughs> damn it. What about Poland? <laughs> Listen, Poland, you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. That's all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Not and not to go further down that rabbit hole, but um, the, that was exactly what uh, what um, Carlin said on one of his uh, was the. The uh, Ost, the uh, the Ost fronts. Oh, the Ost fronts. Oh yeah. shit! It's like the, oh, the Ukrainians one. were like, "Hey, Germans, great, glad to see you. Thank you. We hated those freaking Russians." And then all of a sudden, like six months later, they're like, "Oh, this really sucks." <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, oh, wait, yeah, they're killing us too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's like the whole the Eastern Front just went back, forth, oh. back. Yeah. Anyway, um, not a lot of laughs. So it okay, took seven. Laughs. Not no, not they, they launched the, the 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 European forces launched seven coalitions against. France and then Napoleon. This was the first one where he kind of rose to fame, um, especially what, through his use of artillery. This was, was great late, late yeah. 17, he was, he was very, very late 1700s, right? This is like 17, this is like 1796, 97, yeah. 96. Yeah. 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 Um, so he, his art, he would have, he had revolution artillery, artillery, and then he would also be like kind of like a, a, a pre modern, like blitzkrieg almost, because he yep. was very, very quick, very, very decisive. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of, you know, a lot of showboating was just there and got to it and people just couldn't keep up with them. Right. And so he kept his supply lines very, very short because they yep. lived up. They did. They just lived up. It was kind of like Sherman in uh, yep. the civil war when he went to the, you know, from Atlanta to Savannah, they just lived off the, the land. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what got him into trouble in Russia was that when they went scorched right. earth, he could no longer live off the land. Correct. Right. He was not an, of noble birth. Right. So they, he was, his family minor was no nobility. Level. Right, low level uh, Cors aristocrats in Corsica. In Corsica. Is that what, yeah. Corsica. Yeah. Corsica. Yeah. So Corsica. unlike unlike the generals and those that, and he went to the school. He went to um, shit. It's where he's buried now too. But it's anyway the the, the France's equivalent of West Point. Um, so and he got he got into the 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 school and he he did he was an indifferent but okay student. But what he noticed was all the the, the instructors and all the the officers were all part of the nobility. Even after the revolution, they had. They were still of noble families that now bought into the revolution, but these guys didn't really do much. Like you said, all right, they were more intent on plotting and siege warfare and making sure, wait for your army to catch up to you and make sure you have enough men. And he was completely different. He's like, nope, get to the battlefield with more men as soon as possible before your enemy does. And that's, and yep. he just ran rings around and not just, by the way, not just other French generals, but 
all the other European generals uh, as, as until until he met Wellington. So do you know why he had more men? I thought this is one of the, I think, an underrated part of really the whole French Revolution and nationalism in general. But do you know why he had more men? Then, like you mentioned the coalitions earlier. Do you know why other countries need to form coalitions against the French? Yeah, oh, he, they, he was the first one to do conscription soldiers. Conscription. It was. He was. Uh, yes. Conscription and also the pretty much essentially the same thing. But it would. You are not fighting for a person, right? Because it used to be true. You're fighting for the king, right? Yep. So like the like the British troops in the American Revolution were fighting for King George. They were English troops. You know, they were under British rule, obviously, but they were fighting for the king. This was the first time in history they're using. Any, anyone right you are fighting you are fighting for france you're a, a french soldier so you don't have to be your loyalty is not to the king it's to, it's to a country which really sparks this idea of nationalism which was the biggest fear for these you know these uh, autocratic countries all around france because guess what nationalism doesn't really go too great with monarchy yeah. especially with absolute monarchy so that's that was one of the huge reasons that all the countries around France were terrified of what was happening in France because they were they were you know the French propaganda saying oh they were freedom fighters and the soldiers believed it when you said yep. liberating they actually believed they were going to these different places around Europe and freeing them liberating them from the from the you know the, the monarchy that a lot of these countries are living under. Yeah, correct. They uh, and and the fact also is they were broke. They had no fucking money because they've been fighting these inter-European wars for hundreds of years and years, they, yeah, uh, yeah, they were running out of the, the nobility was living way beyond its means they had no intention of of changing the tax structure or making things more a little bit more equitable for even the peasants who on whom they rely for soldiers food everything and they saw what happened in france because they ignored it too right and ran up these huge deficits so by the time napoleon rolled i should say when when uh, a revolutionary france starts trying to export their revolution um, and they're, they mount these armies uh, to attack and, and to, to first, ideally, they want to get rid of it and put the Bourbons back on power. But they were like, okay, we just need to like crush the army in the field. But they didn't. They lost. And they didn't have enough to do it on their own. So they had to form. It's also a financial thing. They need to form. They needed money to, 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 uh, to defeat these armies. And the only one who did was England, mm-hmm. who wisely yeah. stayed out of the coalitions until the end. Yeah. And then. And then they blockaded France and prevented them from even being able to trade at all and Correct. couldn't make any money any, anyways at all. So, Correct. But then well, there's also I, the Napoleon had the continental system. It was exactly. That's just yeah. What I was Where they were, he was just like, listen, no one's going to trade with England. Like, I don't have to right. tell you. And then oh, everybody shit. ignored it. <laughs> yeah, there was a huge amount of smoke. That that was a big mistake by Napoleon doing the continental system. So what, I, I'm not I'm not too familiar with that. What is the what is the continental? system what do you mean by that so i believe what it was was you know england and france were essentially at war but never really ever, ever did anything because if france ever got into england mainland they would decimate them but the, the british navy was so strong that france could never get over there but england would never attempt to come over to france so it was kind of just like this weird stalemate so the way they would combat it was through economics and a con and the continental system is that what it was called again yep. it, yeah uh, it basically was like france and the other nations that are on mainland Europe just agree that they would not trade with England and it would just be within themselves. But everybody ignored it because England was such a giant superpower. Uh, but it became costly too. Smuggling is it, expensive. It raises it prices. became costly. And then like it also didn't hurt England that much anyways because their empire spanned across the entire world. Right. They started yeah. focusing on the Americas or the, you know, the <laughs> South Pacific to, for trade instead. Yeah. Yep. So, and that's why, so, and the French were big into using things like privateers and stuff to do that too. Well, that's the one thing the revolution didn't really overthrow was the French Navy never really lost its bourgeoisie, you know, the, the freaking uh, nobility. And they didn't really like Napoleon or respect him at all. And to, to his detriment, he didn't really put enough attention in, in fixing the, the Navy. I mean, the day he won Austerlitz was probably the greatest victory of anyone at all. Well, except for Hannibal, mm. maybe. But yeah, okay. But one of, ranks in the top five global wins for a general. He beats four other, three other armies. What was it the the Battle of Four Emperors? I think it was called. At the same on the same day, he loses Gibral- at, to, at Gibraltar. Right, and well, the fleet is year- de- de- destroyed. Eighteen oh five, right. Yeah. I want to say because that's when he really kicks it. Because that that mean because oh five is when he kicked off the really the campaign across Europe, across I guess what do you say northern Europe technically, yeah, like up into more towards like Germany, then eventually making its way toward Russia. 
You can um, make the argument that that to yeah, the, the, the Rhineland coalition. the Rhineland Confederation that he structured for the German principalities led the way to a modern Germany. Bismarck just picked up what he had yep. started and kept it going. Yeah, and that's so, something that's that's something that's tough for people to understand when they look back at at this. Like the French Revolution itself is confusing enough, but you can't really. It's tough to understand it fully without really knowing how Europe was at the time. Yeah, like there really there was no Germany, there was no unified Italy, there was Correct. no like we were talking. You talking about the earlier? You talking about the Austro Italians? Yep. Right, like that's. You never, never heard yeah. of such a thing before. Right. So, well, that's the beginning. Though, was also the Holy Roman Empire was still around. Yeah, mm -hmm. correct. The, yeah, the, map the, map of of the map of 18th century Europe or 1800s Europe is just so confusing. Just like going through a time lapse, yeah. it just freaking shifts everywhere because there's so many wars. It, Napoleon is just, it's hard to follow. Yeah. But it, it starts with France, though, because again, that yeah. nationalism, the the idea of a unified France, a unified country, they were really one of the first to, to do it. Like England had theirs, but they were an island. It's kind of easy to have your set Correct. your set boundaries and who rules what when you're an island, right? When you're surrounded mm -hmm. by water on all sides. England was one of the first kind of continental powers in Europe really to be a you know a a a country to be to be nationalized. Correct. And that's good. And that's again, like I said, terrified the rest of the rest of Europe. And that's because the the Holy Roman Empire itself was just a disaster. It was um, you know, it was formed a thousand years before, you know, eight, in 800. Isn't that crazy? You know? and, yeah. and, it, and France never joined it. There's never been a Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor who was French, and they never were a part of it because they saw that you'd be suborning your celestial or, or territorial power to the Pope, and they never did that. But it was the, the Pope Germans, the principalities did. They all competed. For, that used to be very lucrative, so they all competed right. for, that, for that money that came with that. But, of course, they all had their wars with the, with the Pope as well. So yeah, by the 18th century, the Holy Roman Empire was. Voltaire said it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it's not an empire. At this point, was it relocated back to Rome? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was basically just another, essentially just another Italian city state. Because you learn about the, like you hear a lot about the city state, especially looking like the Renaissance era, like mm -hmm. you hear about like yeah. Florence and Venice and all the like the yeah. Renaissance being sparked there and all that. Yeah, yeah right. Really, that's was how Italy state. state or papal states, whatever. Mm-hmm. The That's Papal States, were, correct. Yeah. The, Leia, the Leia turn or whatever it was called, but yeah. yeah. So that made me wonder when I was reading about this a little bit more. Is Napoleon a little overrated? <laughs> I mean, he's fighting, he is the... I don't think so. No. He's the first of his... So I say, though, he's the first... Cancel this guy. Well, what if, so again, you want to talk about Carl? Oh, Carl said it, he said it best. He goes, I spend 30000 long. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you were saying? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting my mic muted for asking questions. <laughs> yeah. That censorship, RA is pro censorship. I'd like that on I'm record. Saying. We are live. Pro, People pro know censorship. That RA is pro censorship. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Very clear. Glad so why you think about that. him? So, so what you're about to do is be like, yeah, I just expended 30,000 lives a month and then – you know, during World yeah. War One, they were expending thirty thousand lives a day. Yeah, but it's all in yeah. context. But but that's my point, though. He was the first to do it. He was like, "Hey, if I have all these, if I have these people, if I'm more unified than the person I'm fighting, if I'm so, it'd be like, it's, isn't that it, what makes him like not overrated though? Because he was a visionary and could think of this before. Yeah, he was revolutionary as far as military tactics or tactics are concerned. Yeah, so that, I, that, I think... that would honestly be, be like saying, "Hey, you know what, Genghis Khan's overrated because the horses. You know, like he was the first one to use horses, but now everyone uses horses. But he also the only thing about Napoleon that that you can fault him from militarily on is he never crushed the enemy at their capital, destroyed, burned Berlin to the ground, burned Vienna well, to was, the ground. He was in Vienna a couple times. He could have easily he, just he spanked he around that emperor. Exactly. And when he turned his back and went back to France, saying, "Okay, we got a treaty. We're all set. You know, okay, good. We're done." A couple of years later, here comes the you know Austria-Hungarian emperor again. Forming up yeah. with the Russian Tsar, or yeah, I didn't really understand why he just didn't crush you know, him. Like, like I said, he, he's got what seven coalition wars going against exactly, him. Exactly, exactly. Why doesn't he just get rid of Austria? You know, and then bingo, Prussia, and yep. you know, he tried to get Russia, but that did, although even if he had gotten to, you know, Moscow or you know, he took would, Russia, would he, would he have just been like, all right, treaty time? Right, right. And the, yeah, that was uh, the Alexander um, uh, 
I think it was Czar Alexander or Czar Paul. I can't recall which one. But one of them was a big fan of his. I was like, oh, it was a, it was a real Francophile and a, and a fan of Napoleon. And I think he dies and his successor ends up saying, fuck this guy. And it's like, you know, we'll join England's coalition. We're not going to pay for it. England will pay for it, but we'll help. Yeah. yeah it's like, just, it was, he just, Napoleon's problem was he, it was never, it was total war, as to use RA's expression, but it was never total victory. Yeah. So, but like, Okay, so let's, say, come on, let, let's say he did raise uh, <laughs> Vienna or or Berlin or Moscow. Like he did try setting up some other uh, like puppet states, but they weren't very yeah, successful. Nice. They Spain, weren't, yeah, yeah, they weren't successful either. The Spain was a bad up, place. Yeah. yeah, so it's like maybe. But he, he, he only did he did half measures. He did right. half measures mm -hmm. in Spain because he still had you know all the. If he just like focused on Spain, like he sent over like a, a BS he his army brother. over there. But it, yeah, yeah, yeah like on the, the throne, and, and he just like conquered Spain and just got rid of everyone. Yeah, like, I mean, okay, I, now you're on the throne. I, he, he just half-assed it, I guess. I just think strategically, it probably wouldn't have worked out because, like I said earlier, he's surrounded on all sides. It's like if you're going to raise one city and then create a puppet state, you have to have a presence there for a long time. Does he have enough people to be there and control the masses and eventually get them to, you know, kind of assimilate with his army while also fighting, you know? five other fronts on this war. I like, I don't think so. I think his best bet was probably to try to create some kind of treaty. Well, my thing was if he did, obliterated the Habsburgs in, in Austria and Vienna, they've already did, they already did it to the, well, to the Bourbon succession, but they've already, you know, decapitated the, the leadership of, of, uh, in France should have done the same thing. Would have caught, would have stopped a lot of coalitions. Just go in there and take them out. Yeah. Well, take, take heads. Yeah. You but they had this though. thing like royalty. Well, you know, and then of course he declared himself emperor, right? So he'd be, he crowned he'd be himself to separate a, himself from the Holy Roman Empire. Exactly. And he, he and invited he, the Pope to the ceremony. Yes, literally yes, crowned yeah. himself. Yeah. And like, yeah. just literally, yeah. he, he, the, he probably did like the Pope, like a uh, nope. Yep. Yeah. Like that's that's badass. He trolled <laughs> he trolled the Pope. A baller yep. move. Psych. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm he, also did, he also did all this like before he turned thirty, which is which is insane. Like this is the other reason why I don't think he's he's overrated. I mean. He was a visionary, and he just got shit done. Like he, yeah, he, he would have lived that long back then, though. Who cares? <laughs> Thirty's like fifty. <laughs> With <hours>. that, <laughs> but who cares? He still did it before he was thirty. Like that, <clears throat> he, went, he went from like middle nobility, like ba basically nothing, to really, emperor yeah. of France. Like also, we just talked about the Pope. We just talked. About, they, they had nothing at that. If he did that in you know fifteen hundred, it would have been impressive. He did in the there was the Pope was nothing at that point. Everyone's doing their own thing. I'm not so sure about that. There was no real, remember the Holy Roman Emperor ended in what, 1806 when Franz Joseph gave up the throne after, after Napoleon beat him. Yeah, so that's it. And it, and, it, his ass. and it disintegrated, right? Um, but no, that, come on, come on, KDL. That's a badass move. <laughs> oh, you know, it's like he stands up to get ready to be crowned and he goes, I'll take that, thanks. What I, the, oh, the Catholic Church is not, was not the military power that it used to be. Military, no, no, not at but all. Like, yeah, who, but it was who, a spiritual power. Yeah, but like, who, who even cares? The uh, France just went through an entire revolution to put in like a democracy, and he's just going to take it back. That sucked. And he call himself <laughs> emperor. Like, like, well, you know the famous story that that um, Beethoven's third symphony was called. Uh, it's now called Eroica. It's a, a heroic, right? But it was originally dedicated to to uh, the consulship of Napoleon Bonaparte. And then when he declared himself emperor, he, you know, supposedly in the original manuscript, he's got that crossed out, you know, that he's dedicating it to, to Bonaparte. Really? Yeah. He, wow. he, that doing that was a big deal. They, you know, no one, they thought he was the, the people's hero and, you know, on to Europe and the people in those countries that he hadn't even been to yet were very much behind the French revolution in the manifestation that it took on with Napoleon as the, you know, as, as the, con, uh, the consul, right? But as soon as he declared himself emperor, they were like, okay, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. I still don't right. know why. I got to read a, I read a biography and I can't, or a couple of biographies, and I can't recall why the fuck he would do that. That's so stupid. Yeah. Well, yeah. it was a way to consolidate. If you conquered half of Europe, I'd, I'd probably want to be an emperor too, to be perfect. Yeah. Especially yeah, but then. it was a, it was a power consolidation thing, I think. Also. I think it might have been. Because but he, he because the French government before was not like it wasn't a democracy. They tried it. No. It and then that's when the radicals eventually yeah. took over, wanting more and more and more mm -hmm. and more of, you know, I guess you could say call it a democracy. Um, but by but that, by the time Napoleon comes into power, it's the directorate, and no, they're not voting for anything. No one's yeah. voting for them. There's just like a 
basically like a five man council essentially of like making decisions. If it was 500 years earlier in the 13th, 14th century, he could have pulled it off. But at this point, did he really think that the Habsburgs and the, and the, 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 uh, I'm trying to think who's the family and, um, the, uh, the, the, the head, the, the royal families of Europe are going to accept a new guy, a new family. Really? Right. Who are, who are you? Which why yeah. it was a mistake. It was a mistake to be, I mean, because he's, he's on the your, same your, plane as the kings and, and the, the czars and all that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I imagine like the, 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 you know, whether it's the, the, the Kaiser, the Prussian, the, the king in Prussia or the king of Prussia, it depends what year it was. Um, and, and the Austrian emperor, Austria Hungarian Emperor, they were probably like, you know, okay, we we, have, we, have, we give up, we give up, we give up. And it's like, you know, okay, he helps them back up, doesn't do anything, kind of cuts back their land, takes it for France, free some of it. Throat. He should have gone for the throat, exactly. Just said, you know what, Habsburgs, you're out. Yeah. You know? and, and he probably could have too, because you're out. You're out. a lot of those basically the the French army in week. What, 18, 1808, 1810 was made up of a lot of people from around Europe. It wasn't all Frenchmen at that time. Again, they were losing. So, so like months, you had said about nationalism, months. though, at that point, they had been fighting, they are fighting for Napoleon. They are, they are no longer fighting for France. Vive people from yeah. Spain I still and think that's Austria. True. And they are now fighting. Because the, the story is when he comes back from Elba, you know, from exile. Mm -hmm. um, Why do you he, say exile you know, like he, that? He, he, do you really think he was in exile? Do you really, do you really think it was in well, exile? He, like, he was like ruling. I, the, I think the he was islands. fortified. Like, uh, what do you mean? He was away. He was, he was gone. KDL, yeah. that's like literally saying, you know what? KDL, you're out. You're going to be, we're sending you to Martha's Vineyard. Get the hell out and never that's return. Like, I know, like, right? That's like, <laughs> that's like, <laughs> that's like suspending the Nantucket. 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 There you go. Nantucket. 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 Yeah. 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 I picked up on that. Don't worry. We took care of him. He's in Nantucket. Don't worry. Yeah. yeah he's, he's, yeah. But, but when he comes back from Elba, you know, he's met on the, Met on the shore by the French armies, and they go, Viva la Emperor. They're not saying Viva la France, they're saying Viva la Emperor. The best scene, though, if, if it, I would have loved to have been a witness to, is like later on after that, he lands in Marseille, right? And you're right, they, they, they greet him. He gathers up, you know, thousands of people who have, who have now gone flipped over and gone back to the Bourbons. And I think the, the, the French government sends an army to meet him on the road as he's walking to Paris or on a horseback, but he's leading an army to Paris. And the army confronts them, and one of them is his former general. And they level their guns at they're gonna go to war, they're gonna fight a civil war again. Again, again, Napoleon gets out, gets off his horse, walks up, opens up his coat, and says, I'm your emperor, here I am. And it's like they were like, they took they had the guns ready to go, and they're like, Oh, Napoleon, they all yeah, threw their that, guns that, and that, joined them. So those that's are not fucking, people who are fighting for France. I'm that's sorry. a badass. That's, Come on, he was he was a he's got a lot of cool drop like, the mic moments. Oh, that's well, one of my it, there's, also, there's also stories like when he was a general, like he was leading the artillery and he would like literally join them. He was yeah. aiming he was aiming the cannons with the soldiers. Like that's yeah. the kind of leader. That that, that's what Hannibal follow. did at Cannae. Yes, at Cannae, um, you know, Hannibal went in with his infantry who was supposed to, you know, make the crescent. He was so it basically saying like, listen, if you die, I die too. Correct. Now that was Napoleon's mindset. He was obviously a reader of some of the ancient jungles. Mm -hmm. and, and not and not only that though, but unlike his his counterparts uh, or at the time, they didn't do that. They led from the rear. Even mm -hmm. Wellington led from the rear. Yep. He led up front. You know, and even the, when he crossed into the Alps and, and attacked tactically, he did the same thing. You know, he was on with his he was, you know, rode a donkey with his men at the front of the line through the snows and did it. He was a badass. He was not one of these uh, armchair generals uh, by any sense. Mm -hmm. Well Trying to be snappy with this, so let's get into more of the downfall. Mm. Comes back. Uh, do we? Do we? So, so he goes away. <laughs> it goes away. You have to. Talk goes away to Elba, which is for those who don't know. Honestly, like you can throw a rock from Italy into Elba. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it is. It is the dumbest place you could ever exile anyone. <laughs> right. They might as well send it to Corsica. Especially the, the, the you have got the most dangerous man in Europe, and you're like, in the oh, world. We're going to put him a half mile off the coast of Italy. Yeah. No boat. He'll be, he'll be oh, fine. He didn't have any boats, though. There were no boats. Yeah, right. Yeah. He could have windsurfed. Yeah, he could have <laughs> walked. Low tide, he could have got there. <laughs> he would have been in knee deep water at low tide when I made it to Italy. And RA, tell, give the full story. While he's on Elba, what, what's the rest of Europe doing now after the war? So they go back to the Bourbon monarchy. Yep. The yep. whole French Revolution. You know, the whole thing that happened, all of a sudden the French were like, you know what, we're going to bring back Louis XVI's brother. Good idea. 
And so <laughs> the French Revolution at this point has been going on for fifteen plus years. Yeah, but in one, one way or another. Said I am the rebel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So another drop the mic moment. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so then they they get back, and then all of a sudden, all the same vices. That's it, it just the same exact shit happened exactly all over again. And, and all the people in France, are like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. what what did we just kill all these people for? Well, my my thing was when while Napoleon is like uh, changing his clothes, having his laundry done, having horses shooed or shod, they're in Vienna. The heads in Europe are in Vienna carving up Europe. Okay, we're going to put France back to where it was. They're going to put the Bourbons. Uh, hey, uh, Prussia, you're going to get your lands back. And Austria, you're going to get your lands. And meanwhile, he's like, the, nobody thought like, the dude's like literally like off. Oh, fuck, you know, you know, he's like right there, right? You know, he's awesome. nobody even thought of that. You could be done so, with yeah, they were still like, in Vienna when they when they freaking when he when he landed in Marseille. They were still like wrapping up Vienna. This oh, sounds shit. like post World War One. <laughs> yeah, no, oh, divide up the world. Love drawing maps. It's one of their favorite things. Oh, they yeah. love drawing straight lines through uh, land, regardless through, of through places the that they don't own. Whoever's living land. there, yeah. they, <laughs> they, no, they have no regard for who lives where. Who's yep. warring with who? They just love straight lines through the desert. I'll send you guys a, a YouTube link of the Treaty of Westphalia and it's, it's a comedy sketch and they're sitting around the table dividing up Europe. It's hysterical. Who wants Luxembourg? I don't know. They get good cheese? Yeah, I'll take it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. Yep. All right. You want to tell it? So he comes back, conquering hero. Comes back, you know, comes back from Europe or comes back from his vacation, picks up all the people, ends up going to, you know, terrorizing some more, you know, countries, yada, yada, yada. hundred days later, he's at Waterloo and, uh, Got the Duke of Wellington there, and yep. rumor has it, yep, he was in a little bit of pain because of his tummy, and he dabbled in smoke him the night before. Yep, the and night before slept. Waterloo, and perhaps the next day also, because he woke up late that day. He was sluggish. His armies were sluggish, and I think he, the Duke of Wellington also said, like you know, it could have gone either way. You know, it was a it was fifty. It was a it was a fifty fifty ball pretty much. So that, and that was a coalition not, also, right? That was the yeah, seventh oh, yeah. coalition. This is, after, this, is at, this is after he tried uh, invading Russia, correct? Oh, no, this is, yeah. He no, invaded th- Russia before. Oh, we didn't even talk about eight, that. 1812. Yeah, we, Russia was 1812. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of a big part of this. Yeah. That is actually, that's true. I was trying to get us there, but we kept going back to the exile thing. Well, so. we, could do a part, we could do a part two. No, let's just get it out of the way now. <laughs> then lead on. Yeah, okay, has got to be places, so I, I want to prolong this as long as possible. No, you want, you want, <laughs> I mean, whatever you want to do. <laughs> Nope. He's looking at the clock. Nope. Go, go so ahead. He, so, 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 1812, he goes and he's like, you know what? I'm going to take Russia. And, uh, like, like, well, Russia betray, has betrayed him too, too many yeah, times. But, yeah. Yeah. Like, so, he's they not keep going back on the, on the, uh, the continental uh, economy deal. They keep trading with England. Right. They were the first yeah. ones to break the agreement and, and trade with England. Yeah. So, right. he's not thrilled. And, like, and he's been kicking the czar's ass up and down Europe and everywhere Every but Russia. Yep. Correct. So he was like, you know, let's just go on to Russia and see what happens. And uh, so with, with his 650, like 600,000 men, yeah. 600,000, 650, sure. something like that. And he, you know, slouches his way through Russia, bogged down because his, like we had said earlier, he relied on speed yep. and he would live off the land. And that allowed him to have very, very short supply lines. What the Russians did, their strategy was, hey, what if we just run away and burn everything? And it worked. So they had a scorched, well for Russia. scorched earth. Yeah, and historically this works well for the Russians. You can just run back into 6,000 miles of land. Correct. So scorched earth policy and Napoleon's troops just starved. And then the winter and then he When he got to, to Moscow, Moscow, there was nothing. nothing got to, they got to they Moscow. Burned, they burned, they burned, burned Moscow. down Moscow. Yeah. Which is, a key, which is weird because Moscow wasn't the capital at that time. So Correct. why he was trying to take Moscow and not St. Petersburg. I don't was know. There, was there some like significance to the city, like symbolism or something like that? I think it was closer because he had also uh, dumped Josephine and he married some Polish princess and she's the one who had his own yeah. child. So I think to secure his, his uh, supplies, he needed Poland behind him. So that's was the launching point. Um, and I think, you know, you cut across what the Ukraine, Belarus, and your Moscow's clo- much closer than St. Petersburg. No, St. Petersburg's way Poland. north. Yeah. St. Petersburg, yeah. it's not that far, whatever. Yeah. Anyways, so well, he gets, gets to Moscow and he thinks that he's yeah. like, you know, checkmate because the city's burned to the ground. He, he sends over an envoy to St. Petersburg being like, hey, I got your city. Like, let's let's get this treaty signed. And they never send a reply. And after yeah. a month, he's sitting there and it's like November and it's freezing. And he's just like, shit, like yeah. they're never going to reply to us. And so he, he starts back on the walk of shame. 
It has to go all the way from Moscow. Back. It's, it's not funny because of how many people die, but it, it is no. it is extremely ironic in the sense of shit. Mm-hmm. No, they're not listening to us. I guess we'll just go home like, now. Well, we just, there's nothing Massive else for me to do but take sky. my ball and go home. Guess we'll leave. And, now, they, the and then time, they had the Cossacks. They had the Cossack riders, the horsemen yeah. that, you know, raided. And so they're just like pestering them the entire way back. He loses 500,000 men. Yep. He loses a half a million men on the way back. And he's, you know, he's never the same after that. And never the, the same. Of, and, uh, and at the same time. Story of Russia. And at the same time, um, he wasn't the Duke of Wellington at the point at this time. But at the same time, uh, Arthur Wellesley is kicking the shit out of the French forces in Spain and Portugal. So he's kind of losing both fronts at the same, you know, this is a, a this not a good huge time blow. for Napoleon. Not a good time. 2000. I mean, in 18, 12 18, 12. was not a, not yeah. a good year. Not a good year. No. So yeah. then obviously we fast forward again to Waterloo. Yep. Which will be the, the Waterloo. I guess the, which will lead to the, I guess you call it a, a real exile. Well, to, to just what is dead. it? What a contrary to popular belief, Apple was. <laughs> there it is. So what I was going for. Just before you before you go there, though, KDL, the yep. you know he lost Waterloo. Tell you can tell read, that you got it. The same thing that that Ra mentioned. I had read the same thing that he might have been under the influence or feeling the effects of a laudanum or opium dose that he took. He uh, tried, because he tried, he tried killing himself, didn't he, before the battle? No. I no, I think he had a, he had he had a tummy ache. Yeah, oh, yeah he had a bad pain. stomach. He had, oh, he had, I, he had I read, terrible. I read 30... somewhere that I read somewhere that like towards the end of the war, like he knew he was about to get surrounded, so he carried a vial of poison around his around his. Uh, oh no, that that was yeah. after that was after the battle. That's after that, the battle. That was when he was okay. in custody. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was yeah. We're talking about medicine. before the battle. He had a tummy ache and was like, "All right, I will well, myself kill this tummy ache with some opium." And uh, he had a lot of maladies, to be honest, uh, for because the life he led and the stress and the, probably his diet and shit. But um, uh, you know, he had hemorrhoids, <laughs> he had stomach ulcers, he had uh-huh. migraine headaches. Um, he he had a lot of uh, a lot of health issues for a young guy. Right, he sounds was like, like a thirty-two stressed out guy. Very stressed out, but Very stressed you know, out ruling most of Europe. His brain was going so fast and was so strong that it, his body couldn't keep up with it. But the night before, yeah, he had like stomach ulcers wow. uh, or an ulcerated stomach or something, and he took laudanum. He always woke up really early on battle mornings, like, you know, well before, you know, 3.30 in the morning, he's up and ready to go for a battle that's going to start at dawn. So this day he overslept. They had to wake him up, and he's never been woken up before. So obviously something was uh, mm-hmm. was causing him to sleep. And he, in. They say he's groggy and he's slow. Yep. So he was he slow. Not- Correct. And he still could have won, but the the big thing was that the 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 coalition that was led by Wellington at this point had the he had the Dutch, he had the, the Belgians, it was in Belgium, the battle itself. Um, they were waiting for the Prussians. And and Blucher, the, the Field Marshal Blucher got freaking lost. He didn't he couldn't find the battle. And of course, the your rule is in those days, see the smoke, that's where the battle is. Follow the sounds of the cannon. And he didn't show up until late. And he uh, showed up at the right time. As I was gonna say, it actually because, worked out to their benefit. Yeah, yeah. because I think it wasn't that was a decisive moment because the battle was it. at the point was going either way. Napoleon called out the um, what was his all right? What was his his special core? He called out the um, uh, shit. His elite, his elite troops to to yeah. finish to finish the day. And after they were spent, or as they were in the middle of fighting the the English. The, the Prussians show up out of the woods and it's yeah. like, oh shit. The Imperial Guard. The Imperial Guard, thank you. So the Imperial, yeah, he had already just de- deployed the Imperial. Had he waited or had he known they were there, he would have probably just held them off and kept the Imperial Guard in reserve. And then who knows what would have happened, but nope, he lost. And thus, and then they really exiled him. Then they yeah, really they, they real exile. <laughs> and they they really, really exiled him. Exiled him. <laughs> yeah. Then they, they learned from, you know, keeping them. 30 yards offshore and was like, all right, we're going to put you into the St. St. Helena. Yep. St. Helena. St. Helena. So, Helena. For those who don't know, it is in, it is one of the most isolated uh, inhabited places on the planet. Today. It's literally between, you know, uh, uh, South it's America the, continent and uh, far South and, and Africa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like 1200 miles away from the nearest continent. The nearest. Yeah. Like, wow. like today it takes like a week to get there. Yeah. From like uh, London. Because there's no airstrips today, but yeah, so they put him on there and they give him this damp housing, and 
He's yeah. able to, he, he, they, they proclaimed him governor of St. Helena. That was his yeah. title. It was kind yeah. of just a slap in the face. But And of course, the rumor was that he was slowly being poisoned with arsenic in, in untraceable amounts, but over the course of years, you know, it, it took its effect on him because right. he was already unhealthy anyway, right? And he's in an unhealthy. It was place. arsenic, stomach cancer, going back yeah. to his tummy aches. Yeah. Um, either way, 1821, you know, does. See yeah. ya. That's about it. That's the end of Napoleon. And that's Napoleon. So, so well, um, fun fun fact, um, because after he uh, after they, they sent him back to France and they buried him, and then they built a special tomb for him. But during the course of uh, after the years after his death, France had you know more strife, civil wars, um, back and forth with imperialism and republicanism and back, you know, just ceaseless wars. We all saw Les Mis was that was what yeah. that part. So they built this fantastic sarcophagus form, which have you guys ever been to see it in Paris? Mm -hmm. It's fucking awesome. Um, I, I had a picture of it. I was hoping to show, but I don't have it on me. But um, uh, they opened up his tomb 25 years later, 1850 or something, 1855 or something. And the witnesses said that uh, he looked exactly the same. There'd been no decomposition, which led to the rumors of arsenic, by the way. Right. His fingernails had grown. His hair had grown, and he never could really grow a full beard as an adult. But he had wisps of a of like you know two decades long growth. And they they were astonished. Wow. So yeah, and they closed him up and put him in the, the sarcophagus. Wow. Well, yeah. On that there's note, your, there's your fun fact. We should on a, Ned. You get a fun fact every show. You're gonna you're gonna end us on a fun fact. And I think we should do more of the long hair. Ra, like, Ra knows he's got the one. He, Ra got the one with the uh, you know he had the opium problem. Yeah. Yeah. But. All right, gentlemen, glad to be back. We'll do this again, try to be weekly, maybe bi-weekly, depending on how, how we're doing, but I'm pretty pretty open. I know Ned's not working anymore, so he's he's yep. wide open. To, Ned's yep. done saving the he's world. He's open, so. and then you know, saving the world. Right. RA's done with the basement, so obviously we're all, you know, all nice and free. So yep. um, what do you think? Next time, Napoleon the second? <laughs> no, we're, 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 we're all set. <laughs> we're killing Napoleon. There's some there's something. All right, you ready to get us out of here? All right. Mongols. Yeah, what? So, gentlemen, thank until you. Next time. Until next time. Yeah.